uh, Peter's mother-in-law? Yeah, ma'am. Would her husband put her out? Yeah. Remember, she may have been divorced by her husband because of this, or maybe not. You know, if he was a kind husband, he may let her come home, but she's unclean. So therefore, she can't, right? But she'll say, I'm safe. Why would she be safe or say? Because then she can re-enter her husband's home. Then she can re-enter her family's home. She's unclean. She can't even go to her own home. She can't go to the temple. She can't do anything in that culture. She can't even beg. It's, it's horrible for her. Well, Jesus touching the uh, girl would make him unclean because he touched a corpse. And yes. the woman touching Jesus makes him unclean because an unclean person touched him. Right. Well, watch what happens. Watch what happens. She says, if I only touch his cloak. If she touches his cloak, and by the way, literally this says the tisted, the the, the uh, fringes, because all Jewish men had a fringe cloth. If you go to, you know, look at a Jewish guy who's dressed up for the Shabbat. He'll have a cloak, a fringed, vest on, right? And it has tisted. And she's literally saying, if I touch the tisted, the, the fringes on his cloak, which, by the way, is a holy thing that she's not supposed to touch. So she says, if I touch it, Jesus turned and saw her. Take heart, daughter, your pistis, your persuasion, the fact that you're persuaded. Persuaded by what? What was she persuaded by? She knew that she was... The Logos. When did Christ give the Logos? The Sermon on High Place. The word pistis, and I guess I should go over it someday. I'm not going to, I don't have time today. But pistis means, faith. we translate pistis as faith. It means to be persuaded of an argument. That's what pistis means. Not faith, to be persuaded of the argument. What is the argument she was persuaded of? The Sermon on High Place. What Jesus told her was the kingdom of heaven was like. See? Which is the thesis of Matthew, the, right? This, we see this continually in the document. It's not faith in your belief. Well, you could say belief is pisteo. Pisteo means what? To have been persuaded. See? Persuaded of what? The Logos to tell us. In the Greek, this is obvious. To us, you know, we, we miss the point. But that's okay. Jesus turned, so I take heart. Your pistis has Suzo has saved you, not healed you, saved you. We want to throw healed in there. Why? Well, because we, well, we, we think, remember I told you, physicians in the ancient world did not heal disease. They let you die. They'd heal you if you had a wound. They might stitch you up. But they let you die otherwise. Because why? You're unclean in, in Greek, in, in Hebrew thought, in, in, in Greek thought, you're what? Possessed by a demon. Yeah. Or you're cursed by Zeus, right? A fever is pure, cursed by Zeus. So in any case, the woman was Suzo, not healed. She was Suzo. She was saved at that moment. So therefore, she is now what? She is a potential to be a bride again to the bridegroom. Who, sa who, sealed, who saved her? Jesus the bridegroom saved her. Do you get this imagery? This is such powerful imagery. And if you understand this, you'll understand why he, he gave the sermon, he gave the uh, parable about the uh, new cloth on the old cloth. Remember, the new cloth is the bridegroom's clothing. The new wine is the wine of the bridegroom, is the wine of the, of the feast. Anyway, let's keep going. Um, uh, we've said a lot of other stuff. I got a lot of other things, but I want to get this. Jesus entered the ruler's house and saw flute players and noisy crowd. Okay. Do you find flute players at Jewish funerals? Are they wail? Yes. Where do you find flute players? Greek funerals. This guy is fully Hellenized. Okay. So yes, he is probably a synagogue ruler. He's probably a ruler of the Jewish people. But guess what? He's Hellenized. So we expect to find the girl in. The guy to see him. Let's see what happens. Uh, when Jesus entered the house, he saw flute players in his crowd, and he said, Go away. This Jesus said, Go away. The little girl, it's literally Chorazion, little girl, is not dead but asleep, and they laughed at her. They laughed at her. So we had a wife who the bridegroom is clean. We have a dead, unmarried girl who is dead and worthless. She has no chance to be a bride. Look what happens. After the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took the girl by the hand, and she got up. 
So the bridegroom, the Son of Man, has power over death. Therefore, he is God. And guess what? The bridegroom just took a worthless girl who could not be a bride and made, gave her the potential to be a bride back again. And literally, this is a metaphor. Because he is the bridegroom, both these women stood in place of Israel, and therefore, he just made them brides of the bridegroom. In other words, brides of God. This, this metaphor is beautiful because he just reached out to the most, um, to people that in a Greek and a, and a Hebrew culture were considered worthless, were considered, you know, isolated, <laughs> completely isolated in the Gynecean, right? And yet he allowed them to be saved through his actions. This is beautiful stuff. Um, I don't want to, there's more in here, but I want to get to 10 because 10 is very important. In chapter 10, it starts. He called, and this is proskleomai, proskleomai. Remember, we, we're used to the words near calling, to parakleo. No, this is not parakleo. He's not calling them for comfort or to punish. He is calling them together toward himself, proskleomai, which is really interesting because remember I told you in Greek, I got a lot of word choices. So the word pro Proskleomai is translated as he called. Proclaim. No, he called. Yes, <coughs> call. it sounds like proclaim. It's saying like, but it says, it literally means in the Greek that he called. What other words do we translate called? Parakleo, kleo, but they all have distinct different meanings in Greek, right? But they're all translated in the English as called. So this is a kind of different calling. Christ is calling them together, calling them toward himself. And it says, dodeke is 2 plus 10. Remember I told you about uh, use of, of numbers? 2 plus 10. 10 digits plus 2. I love this in the Greek. It's beautiful when you see this. He called it 2 plus 10, mathetes, his learners, his mathetes. And he gave them authority, exosa. He delegated his influence to drive out evil, archanthros, to unpurged spirits. To, uh, to drive out <coughs> unpurged or, you know, spirits that are evil. And to, it's not heal. The word is therapeutic. We get therapy out of it, but it means to wait on menially every, it's not disease, malady and weakness. Now, you see, we want to modernize these words, so we translate them as disease and sickness. They're not. It's maladies. What are maladies? What do you think maladies are? If I have a cut, a slice on my arm, that's a malady, right? Because it's something evident that you can stitch up and fix. If I'm unclean, I have an issue of blood. That's a malady, right? If I have a disease in their view, what is, what is wrong with me? A demon has possessed me. So that's why to exuzo, to be able to purge evil demons. And the other thing is weaknesses. So what's a weakness? Well, remember... This is, a, this is a survival culture. In a survival culture, what's the most important thing to get? Food! Half the people walk around, and, and you know, who gets the food? Well, the males, right? And who doesn't get the food? Well, the wives and the kids. You know, look, I wouldn't be surprised if, if half the women were like, you know, malnourished, we'd call them anorexic, because they're not eating. Who's eating? Their husbands are eating and their children are eating. And guess who's feeding them? The wives are. Why? Because the wives want their children and their husband to, you know, the husband has to go out and work, right? And she doesn't want her kids to die. So she's starving herself. And this is probably typical. So Christ is sending them out to the weak. And, you know, we, we like to say, oh, to the sickness. It's not sickness. It's literally weakness. So this ties directly back to what? Where, where else did we see Jesus Christ... <clears throat> Removing demons, helping weakness, and telling them to do this. He told them about it in the Sermon on the High Place, and then in the, in the chapter 8 and 9, which is the narrative, we saw him doing it, right? And we remember that each of those is a metaphor, an explanatory statement about the Sermon on the High Place. So, let's go on. It says in um, 2, the names of the 12, I don't know if the names of the 12, these are names of the 12, and that's cool. Um, and he tells them, he says in five, 
Don't go among the Gentiles or any enter, to enter, enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Okay, this is odd, right? Because what did Jesus tell them in the Sermon on the High Place? Who were they supposed to embrace? The Gentiles and the Samaritan, everyone, right? Mm -hmm. And then who did Jesus embrace in 8 and 9? Everyone, right? He, he healed first who? First guy he healed was unclean. The second guy he healed was the centurion's, probably Optio, the centurion's guy. So already, and now at the end of chapter 8 and 9, who did he heal? Mm -hmm. The women. Okay? So now he's telling them to go to just Israel. Well, let's see what happens. This is really interesting. As you go, preach this message. We know what the message is, right? You could guess. What's the message? Right, and that is an abbreviation. What we find, remember the whole thing is, the thesis is, repent for the kingdom of heaven is a Jesus, is approaching. It's, it's paraphrased here. Why would they paraphrase it? Why? Because they're kind of like a synopsis thing and you got to go back to the... Yeah, well in ancient literature, one of the big things is the cost of the materials and the cost of stuff. So generally in ancient literature, you never see a repetition. You never see a repetition. The fact that they synopsize it here means it's what? Very important. But he's not going to write the whole thing out because he wants to save paper. That's the way it works. So it's, it's just really important that we know this. This is also rabbinic context. What you mentioned before, the rabbinic context means that when you see the synopsis, you go back for the body of the text. And we know what the body of the text is. He says, heal the sick, and that's not heal the sick. I, I didn't translate all this, but notice what it says. It's basically therapeuo. It's suzo and therapeuo. Uh, raise the dead. That's pretty obvious. Cleanse those who have leprosy, actually cleanse the unclean, drive out demons. Okay, freely give what you have received because that's the sermon in a high place. Don't take money, don't take extra time, all this stuff. Um, look what he says. In whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house you leave. Uh, enter the home and give it your greeting. What's the greeting? Shalom, because you're going to Israel. Now watch this, I love this. 13, if the home is deserving, leave your arena... Your shalom rests on it. It's not let your arena return to you. The reason this is important is because what's the key words? Remember in Paul, what is the code word that Paul is talking to Jews? Shalom. Well, the Greek word is arena. Yes, that's correct. Whenever he says arena, which is a Greek word for peace, he's talking to, to Greeks. When he says, what's the code word he uses when he's talking to Gentiles? Shalom. No. Karis, grace. Grace to the Greeks, arena or peace to the to the Jews. And so isn't it interesting that Paul is repeating what Jesus said? Exactly. This is not, you know, like I said, I, I, how can I, I can't. We see it as like, oh, it's just a little saying. It's not a little saying. This is pervasive through the whole New Testament documents. If you see a Logos to tell us in Matthew, what should you expect the Logos to tell us in Paul's stuff to be? Something that's similar. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, if anyone, okay, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your Logos, to your argument, which talks, takes us back to the Sermon on the High Place. Shake the So, what are they supposed to go out and tell? They're supposed to tell the message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is approaching. But what is the Logos they're supposed to talk about? The Sermon on the High Place. He already told you. So, let's see. He should give us some more about this Sermon on the High Place. I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard against men. They will hand you over to local councils, flog you in the synagogues. Okay. What is he telling them here? To be as... You know, we want to take this as, oh, this is a nice little saying by Christ. But what does it mean to be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves? I didn't parse the Greek. I didn't need to. This is a metaphor. This is a cloaked irony. It's hyper, her, hyperbola, hyperbole. The example is from this Sermon on the High Place. Okay, who is snakes? Satan. Satan. Satan is snakes in, G, in, G, in a Greek thing. So that goes back to the Sermon on the High Place. So you should be as shrewd as Satan, Satan and as innocent as what do you do with doves? And where do we find doves in the Sermon on the High Place? The birds that go between God and man, right? And 